For me, travel is the best teacher. Sometimes even more than books. You sense a place from all your senses, you know, from taste to sight to sound. So I think it's so important to be able to travel. The more you travel, the more uh, landscapes that you come across. Those are the landscapes which become uh, the defining factor of what you work. To learn in a week uh, by traveling is more than what you learn in an entire semester of an MBA program. Physical traveling from one place, or through the pages, or through planes and plane windows matters. Delighted to welcome you back to the 14 Jaipur Literature Festival here at the Digi Palace, protected by Dettol. It's our pleasure to present today Technology and Change, Vision 2021. Shannel Valor and K. Vijay Raghavan in conversation with Arun Mohan Sukumar. Our disruptive and dysfunctional times have also led to an acceleration in technologies. A new vision is emerging, which takes us in several leaps in human learning and opens new frontiers across disciplines. These developments are reshaping our habits, environment, and our overall way of life, while simultaneously opening up to new risks within the paradox of a constantly contracting and expanding world. Academic and author Shannon Valor's work explores the philosophy and ethics of emerging science and technologies. Valor is the author of the book, Technology and the Virtues, a philosophical guide to a future worth wanting. K. Vijay Raghavan's work focuses on bringing the benefits of science, technology and innovation solutions to the grassroots levels while ensuring a steady, sustainable development growth for the country. Academic and author Arun Mohan Sukumar's recent book is The Midnight's Machines, a political history of technology in India. He previously headed the technology initiative at the Observer Research Foundation. In conversation with Sukumar, they delve on these rapid changes and discuss the way forward for a more balanced and sustainable future in these very unpredictable times. Shannon Valor is the Bailey Gifford Chair in the Ethics of Data and Artificial Intelligence at the Edinburgh Futures Institute at the University of Edinburgh, where she is also appointed in philosophy. Professor Valor's research explores how new technologies, especially AI, robotics and data science, reshape human moral character, habits, and practices. K. Vijay Raghavan is the principal scientific advisor to the government of India and the chairperson of the Prime Minister's Science, Technology, and Innovation Advisory Council. He was Secretary, Department of Biotechnology, Government of India from January 2013 to February 2018. Professor Vijay Raghavan is also a distinguished professor at the National Center of Biological Sciences Data Institute of Fundamental Research, Bangalore, and was the NCBS director till 2013. Arun Mohan Sukumar is a PhD candidate at the Fletcher School, Tufts University, and a junior fellow at the School Center for International Law and Governance. Ladies and gentlemen, technology and change, Vision 2021. Shannon Valor and K. Vijay Raghavan in conversation with Arun Mohan Sukumar. Good to be here and uh, good to meet uh, Professor Bhala for the first time uh, via Zoom and good to meet uh, you, Dr. Vijay Raghavan, again, uh, although in different circumstances um, and from a different part of the world. Uh, we've got a, um, an exciting topic, uh, two very interesting um, personalities to talk about it, and I'm hoping that during over the course of the session we can soar in the clouds, uh, talking about things from uh, 30,000 feet, as it were, uh, but also uh, both of your experience and expertise allows, uh, allows us to sort of uh, muddy ourselves a little bit, talking about issues in a somewhat granular way in the time that is given to us by the session's organizers. Um, it's a curious time, as uh, you know, to have this sort of a conversation, but it's also an exciting time, and the panel's uh, title so Vision 2021 is is amusing partly because you see in government documents as well as uh, you know consultancy reports about uh, talking about visions of the future in a way that, for example, India. Since uh, Professor Vijayanagarwan, you can correct me. We have been talking about Vision 2020 at least uh, 40 years, 30 years ago, um, and we've been aiming for 2020 to be this 
landmark year for us in socio economic advancement of course by facilitated by technology and you see many documents that are produced by the private sector and the public sector talking about vision 2020 vision 3030 at least 30 or 40 years uh, before those years are actually arrived at and here we are talking about vision 2021 which really uh, while living and breathing 2021 which really speaks to the scale and speed at which technological transformations have unfolded in the last one year and i'm hoping that we can like i said sort of snip in between the abstract and the real as it were um talking about some of the changes that have characterized um the respective countries economies and societies to which both of you belong of course and then from there we can hopefully conclude with <clears throat> some uh, generalizations that may chart uh the the trajectory of uh, our activities in the near future i don't want for us to crystal gaze too far into the future because that can be a professionally hazardous situation at, as it were right uh, at the at this point of time professor wala i want to start with you given that uh, you know you have this deep expertise in philosophy and thinking about technology and philosophy and for the longest time it has been the professional pursuit of philosophers to imagine the good life and you know it has been challenging to live the good life i will tell you over the last one year although my difficulties uh, living in san francisco uh, in living you know having adapted to the work from home or the digital life fairly comfortably living at the heart of silicon valley compared to my situation of course it has been extraordinarily difficult for a number of people including uh, <clears throat> many of my fellow citizens in india for whom um and it is is not just applicable to india but many other parts of the world where unemployment has essentially been uh, has reached cataclysmic levels um suddenly ways of life and livelihood have been disrupted in a way that you know literally in a once in a century fashion and uh, therefore the question that you address in your book <clears throat> about the techno moral future and uh, the challenges of living a good life Uh, with all the technical advancements all the technological advancements as hans is has become a little more challenging uh, to put it mildly uh, when you were writing this book and you know now that the book is out in the open for readers and critics to review and so on and so forth and now of course there is the wisdom of hindsight that appears to all book authors you know what would you change in your book and what would you say to those of us who are living and breathing the pandemic about the challenges of living the good life uh, you know with all the disruptions around us that's a great question arun thank you uh so i think uh one of the things that uh i talked about in my book but i think i would frame differently uh, now um uh, has to do with the kinds of collective moral deliberation uh that are really necessary for humanity to uh not just sort of survive through the 21st century but really flourish um we have been it, it's a cliche now to talk about how technology connects us all um but but really what it does it, is it makes us far more interdependent uh than we have ever been before uh and that's a strength but it's also a vulnerability and i think we've certainly seen that in the past year uh where um we see that uh for example with the pandemic and with uh uh pandemic control um we've seen the way that having uh disparate national strategies and policies um has prevented any sort of global coordination uh, that might have allowed uh a a more um uh a uh, rapid control of of the pandemic and uh the saving of of millions of lives uh, had there been already uh, a preparation to uh to deliberate together about the resources that we have the powers uh available to us the kinds of innovations that we need to bring online uh and how to coordinate their benefit for the human family So one of the things that the pandemic has done is remind us uh, that uh we are really all in one lifeboat um and there's no way for some of us uh to save uh ourselves uh and and cast others out uh it 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 is one of those things that I think is a lesson we will unfortunately have to learn again and again until we get it right 
um, because the because cl global climate change is going to uh, uh, continue probably to drive more of these kinds of shocks uh, to the global uh, technology ecosystem, uh, to the economy, global economy, um, uh, to global public health, um, and we are going to have to figure out um, how to be resilient together. Um, and I think we are still stuck in a 20th century mental model of nation states uh, competing against one another economically, uh, uh, militarily and so forth for some sort of advantage in a zero sum game. And we are playing a very different game right now um, with, the, with, the, uh, with the climate and with the conditions uh, that uh, are required for human survival. So um, I'm hoping that this uh, shock of the pandemic teaches us, for example, um, about not only the need to coordinate more uh, uh, interests and, and, and strategies, but to distribute the, the benefits and protections of technology uh, more equitably and widely. Um, because the places that aren't protected today uh, are the places uh, that are going to uh, uh, prevent uh, us from coming out of this pandemic safely together. Um, so uh, there's more I can say, but I'll, I'll, I'll stop there for now. Thanks, uh, thanks, Rosavella. I think uh, you said it well, and it's unfortunate that it took a crisis of this magnitude to realize, as you said it, um, that we are all in this uh, lifeboat together. Um, I want to sort of uh, feel the question to Dr. Vijayarakhan as well, uh, who is the principal scientific advisor uh, to the Indian government. But more than that, he's also a molecular biologist by training. And I, I wonder, you know, we are all fed this uh, diet of information, overfed this diet of information uh, these days about vaccines. And uh, I happen to read uh, an article, I think it was in the New York Times, who, which said essentially that um, in the United States, researchers have been trying for long to um, come up with ways to, to uh, you know, develop a vaccine towards a coronavirus in a way that would prevent, that would have prevented such pandemics uh, from occurring or other cor coronavirus infections. But the political will to tackle this sort of a initiative or even to just supply it with research grants was just not there in a country as advanced as the United States. Uh, Dr. Vijay Raghavan, I wanted to ask you as, you know, from the vantage point of your training and expertise, and you have been, of course, involved in the Department of Biotechnology in India at a time when we rolled out the rotavirus vaccine uh, in India. <clears throat> Did, was this situation all too preventable? Uh, and now that it has hit us, from especially the, the point of view of India, uh, have we really uh, manage to start walking again, both as an economy, as a society, just recovering from this pandemic? Um, thank you, uh, Arun. There's a you know, lot to unpack in what you asked. Uh, the first point is that if you look at uh, you know, pandemics in general or epidemics, um, you, know, you can list out four or five likely ones. And you know, the rest are unlikely. And then there are others we don't know about. Now, there was an organization that is an organization which India was involved in forming and which I was the co-chair to start with, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, CEPI. And CEPI is playing a very major role now. But when CEPI was formed before, well before this pandemic, about five years ago, CEPI and other organizations, their aim was to get people together to have vaccines at ready to go situations should an epidemic occur. Ebola, MERS, uh, you know, SARS-CoV-1 uh, earlier, and, you know, uh, Nipah, Zika, and so on. The challenge in, is not a technological one alone, of course, there would be technological challenges, but the challenge is where does one mitigate risk for companies to make vaccines which will never be used? And their governments need to come in. And for governments to come in, people need to come in. People have been too used to driving cars without metaphorical cars, without seat belts or airbags. And to ask them to invest in seat belts or airbags because they might need it in the future is something they are not want to do. And so governments don't find it easy to do. So this is a fundamental issue in the context of climate change. Are we prepared? And this holds for both 
epidemics and as also at cost to environment. Are we prepared to pay now for the costs which we get benefits from, from our ecosystem, or are we going to postpone those costs to future generations? It's much easier to postpone it to future generations because we can leave a richer and a fuller life at the cost of future generations. That's the fundamental challenge. And this is the challenge for you know, all countries, particularly so for countries such as India, which also have the challenge to lift you know, hundreds of millions into a reasonable standard of living. Uh, right. At the core of this lies the transfer of technology of various kinds. Uh, technological um, quality and uh, IP, intellectual property, has been amassed as a snowball, as it were, starting from exploiting the environment in various ways. Uh, and that has resulted in an extraordinary uh, repertoire of technologies. These now need to be shared immediately and easily with the globe so that sustainable development can be the focus rather than the use of technology for uh, you know, uh, asymmetric growth as it were. Right. I wanted to follow up uh, with you on, on that, uh, given that um, not just with regards to epidemics or with um, regard to, say, climate change, um, you can see policy formulation in India or even you know, solutions that are developed by the business uh, or from outside of government within India. Uh, you know, I don't want to use the term knee-jerk, but we, we respond and we react to developments as is the case with, you know, now as it, seem, it, it would seem that this is the case with even uh, the advanced industrialized nations of the world. But we are a young democracy. There are certain political pressures, pushes and pulls that any elected government faces uh, as to what should be the priorities uh, of its policy agenda. And if you would imagine if with a sophisticated infrastructure for surveillance and disease control, as has been instituted in countries like the United States or other countries in, say, North America, or Western Europe, um, even with those resources, they were not able to pay the kind of attention that it was required to prevent or mitigate a pandemic of this sort. Uh, you would imagine that uh, India would be on the back foot even further, coupled with the fact, as I said, that we are a young democracy. Our priorities are just sort of, you know, uh, ossifying as it were, and they are all over the place, being pulled in different directions. I wanted to ask you from your perch as the PSA, have you seen this change at least in the last one year? A year is, of course, you know, a, a, a second in terms of the government's lifespan or the bureaucracies or the machine, the bureaucratic machinery's lifespan. But uh, has this kind of thinking changed over the course of one year? I also wanted to ask you, you know, what perhaps candidly, what would you f say has been a source of great frustration for you? Um, in, not just in dealing with the government, but also in dealing with, say, the private sector and other parts of the society, broadly speaking, in trying to roll out efforts to sort of mitigate the effects of this pandemic? Uh, let me first, you know, summarize what you're saying, because you've said a lot here. At the heart of it is an assumption that decision making in India is not based on substantive forward-looking analysis, but on immediate responses to the situation. Uh, that is the core in one sentence. Right. Now, that couldn't be further from the truth uh, because one of the features of Indian mechanism, which gives this impression of it, right. you know, being immediately responsive and not forward-thinking, is that it's an extraordinarily consultative process. And this has been so you know, for many complex decisions, uh, there is always the right decision to be taken, but, you know, it, it just goes back and forth with all sorts of, you know, consultative mechanisms. If anything, India can be accused of every individual having a veto in decision-making or moving the decision-making to a mean, which is a consensus rather than a clear-cut, you know, one view or the other. So that is the... That is the essence. And second point, as a corollary from that, why does that happen? And that happens because of an extraordinary mixture in India of very varied interests. India is a France and a Germany on one hand, a pepper, as I'd like to call it, and a salt of the, you know, 
very difficult context of the world mixed together. And the salt and pepper don't mix that easily. Uh, that is the challenge of India, you know. Uh, you have an elite and you have the rest of India and you have to balance, you know, supporting excellence and supporting equity and dealing with that. Right. That's, that's now one of the mistakes which, you know, the elite have done is to look at models universally and see what is the right way to apply them in India. And there is great value in that, of course, but that is not sufficient. It might be necessary. Indian diverse contexts require an application which contends with the reality of scale. Now, our health system has done that. Our agricultural system has done that. It, you know, all said and done, there are extraordinary feedback mechanisms, which might not be perfect in normal times. It might not do great in normal times, but it prevents disasters from occurring, or when they occur, it comes together to handle them well. It doesn't, so, you know, we must move out of this view that somehow, Examples from elsewhere alone must apply to India. Can, that is necessary to learn. I'm not disputing that at all. But we can't have a situation to say, can India be like Singapore? Can India be like Brazil? Can India be like the US? You know, it's just different. Uh, if anything, India is a mix of all these and you know, one needs to move dynamically. So all that said, uh, now you asked me about you know, working therefore with government and with other agencies. Again here, um, you know, there has been a very, very consultative process in decision making. And if anything in the pandemic that moved both to being consultative and rapid, uh, you know, because one had to act with speed. Right. Um, there are many things which will have to be dissected and analyzed years later. But fundamentally what the world has taught us during the pandemics, uh, during the pandemic, is a difference between preparedness and response. The Western preparedness was supposedly extraordinary, but fundamentally at its heart, the Western preparedness against pandemics was something which happens elsewhere. You know, something breaks out in the Congo, we'll go out there and fix it before it spreads. Something breaks out somewhere else, we'll go out and fix it. And all global attention was about how things start elsewhere. Things don't happen in your own backyard. And that, when it started happened, you saw the stark difference between preparedness and response. In other countries, the preparedness is not so obvious because of a variety of all kinds of complexities on the day to day. But because of a you know, persistence of various kinds of disasters hitting the tropics in particular, but large parts of the South in general, uh, you know, an ability to get together to deal with uh, crises is much more over there, uh, you know, both with the government and, you know, bottom up. So I think we're seeing a combination of responses. It's early to right. say, you know, what was causal, what was correlative, but all that will need to be analyzed. Yeah, and, I, and may I just follow up? Uh, sorry, Professor Valley, if you had a... Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add that, to yeah. that. I actually think that there's a little more to it, it because I think a lot of uh, the Western nations had uh, pandemic response plans that were actually <clears throat> quite detailed at the domestic level. Um, and you're right that there is this uh, unexpected gap between uh, preparedness and response. But it wasn't just that the response wasn't, uh, or that the um, preparation wasn't uh, anticipating sort of domestic uh, impacts and, and the need to address that. Uh, because in many cases that those plans were there uh, and they were well formed. The problem was no one had thought about the problem of political will, uh, which you gestured to earlier. Um, the willingness to say and, and lead uh, uh, in a direction that will involve short-term sacrifices uh, for long-term protection. Um, and to provide the sort of social supports and safety uh, nets that are needed to get people through those sacrifices. People had thought about the, the, the technocrats and the scientists had thought about everything that science and technology would need to mobilize, but no one had figured out how to solve the political challenge of implementing painful uh, responses 
uh, in uh, uh, particularly in uh, contested and fractious political communities like the United States and the United Kingdom. So I think we have to recognize from this, the technology and politics are not separate spheres. And we cannot do well with one while um, ignoring uh, the domain of the other. And unfortunately we have often uh, educated, for example, technologists to not read uh, political history, to not uh, uh, understand how political forces shape design choices, deployments, the spread of technology. Um, and, and likewise, we've often trained uh, humanists and historians and political theorists to be relatively detached from uh, the, the sort of frontiers of science and technology. And that has to end if we are going to be able to build resilient societies for the 21st and 22nd century. We have to bring this kind of technical wisdom and moral and political wisdom together from the ground up. Uh, thanks, Prozola. I, I sort of want to follow up on, on that uh, comment with you. Uh, and it's also in relation to what uh, Dr. Vijay Raghman uh, also uh, spoke about, which is um, uh, the idea that in many industrialized nations, pandemic response or disease outbreak uh, is essentially or was essentially seen as something that happens elsewhere from where um, so I, you know, not to digress, but to just say, you know, many of the, uh, from, a, from, from the vantage point of the international lawyers perspective, I can tell you that many of the global health regulations were crafted in, or at least the important ones that laid the foundation of how we see global health were crafted in the interwar years between the first and the second world war, especially uh, treaties like the 1926 um, international sanitary regulations. And it was epidemic experts who came from the developing parts of the world, especially East Asia, India, and uh, Southeast Asia, who were, who helped put in place uh, because of the necessity for developed countries to transact at the ports of important junctions like Singapore and Tokyo and so on. Um, the, the whole disease outbreak and surveillance mechanism was instituted into the infrastructure of global health regulations at that time. And unfortunately, that legacy seems to have endured, although this was a novel piece of uh, legal and political infrastructure that was put in place for the time. The persistence of thought has endured that this is something that would happen, happen in remote and distant corners of the world, which eventually may make their way to the financial and political capitals of the world, the advanced economies from where, you know, th that, that process has to be prevented and that is all. But once the pandemic reached the shores of uh, advanced countries, it became very difficult as we saw uh, to, to limit uh, those outbreaks. But I, on, on that limited note, I wanted to sort of point, it, point to you because this is an issue that you tackle, I should say, admirably in uh, your book. Uh, about, uh, you know, the need for a techno-moral way of life and the need to base it in, um, I don't know if I'm accurately phrasing you or paraphrasing you, in, in a philosophical context that is appropriate to society. You know, this is a debate that, uh, you know, as a philosopher, you would know this better, uh, about the hegemony of certain ways of thinking about the classics and about philosophy and about ethics. And, uh, you know, the hegemony, especially of the Greco-Roman uh, way, ways of thinking about many aspects of life, including, as we discussed, the, the, way, the good life. Um, you talk about, in your book, about the, the role of, you know, not to sort of uh, snowball it altogether, but Eastern ideologies and Eastern ways of thinking uh, and how they may be in integrated in our ways about developing technology and living with technology. The challenge, and uh, Professor Vijay Raghavan spoke about it uh, briefly, the challenge is that many of these technologies are, are built in uh, some part of the world. They come to other societies many years later. Now it is up to those societies to craft it and deploy it innovatively as India has in some respects and has not in some other respects. Um, is it really possible to have this kind of sui generis uh, philosophy on philosophical or moral approach to technology when uh, that is rooted in one's own society when the fact of the matter is that these technologies are built elsewhere and they may come to you if you are in the developing part of the world you, you know professor vijay raghavan spoke about ip restrictions and so on and so forth but is, is that real is that philosophical context contextualization of these technologies, is, is it really possible given all the barriers that exist uh, to access and affordable access uh, today? 
So uh, the, go ahead, go ahead, uh, Shannon. So the the argument that I, I make in my book is that um, these technologies um, are going to be a- adapted uh, globally in very different ways uh, to uh, contexts uh, that have very different uh, distributions of resources, very different needs, um, and very uh, different often sort of uh, conceptions of the ideal society. And you raise quite well the problem that the technologies themselves are not developed with these plurality uh, of values and ways uh, of flourishing in mind. Uh, They're developed from uh, often an exceedingly narrow conception of the good life, narrower even than, you know, uh, an American mindset or a California mindset. I mean, it is narrower than that. And so this is the greatest challenge that at at least, and this is where my optimism comes from, at least we now see and talk about routinely uh, and see this as something that is not sustainable. Uh, The kind of parochial um, value environment of technology creation uh, needs to be broken down, needs Mm -hmm. to be made uh, not just diverse in a sort of tokenistic way, uh, but rather distributed as a form of, of power to shape the future um, into the hands of uh, the, the sort of broader uh, human family. And uh, we unfortunately, I think, um, have not figured out how to break down uh, uh, the, the, uh, the concentration of power uh, that we've allowed to be consolidated And unfortunately, we have feedback loops in so many of our institutions that once power is consolidated, the existing systems tend to protect it and amplify it. Um, So it's going to take some fairly radical social and economic and cultural changes in order to break down these concentrations of of power. Uh, What in the language of sort of decolonial philosophy, we talk about the metropole powers, right? Um, Those have to be dismantled um, and uh, the power has to be distributed in such a way that we have a multiplicity of technologies uh, that nevertheless are all compatible with a a flourishing planetary future for humanity. Um, And so we have to have a a sort of pluralism and, and multiplicity of values and ways of life that's nevertheless able to um, feed into a sustainable human future uh, on this planet. And I think the conversations about the need for that have started. Uh, The social changes that have to happen to bring it into a reality have not. Um, And uh, I hope that it doesn't take uh, many more sort of catastrophic uh, impacts on humanity uh, for us to be willing uh, to recognize uh, that the time for change is necessary. So let me just sort of wrap up with with the point that was made about uh, India sort of having to uh, uh, receive these technologies created elsewhere uh, and, and, and grow with them. Um, we, we need to move to a, a place where we're not just taking the technologies as given, but we are deciding what sort of technologies we want um, and where that we is not uh, simply Silicon Valley, but where that we can be India, uh, can be uh, um, nations in Africa, can be Uh, nations in South America that can say, um, these are the technologies we need, these are the technologies we want, um, and these are the kinds of futures that we want to be able to create with them. Because frankly, the 8 billion people on this planet cannot be carried into into the future with 1970s and 1980s technology. So we need innovation, we know that, right? We need new technologies. But we also can't carry 8 billion people into the future with 21st century technologies built with a 1980s mindset, right? That's not going to work either. And unfortunately, that is what we have today is we have 21st century technologies that are built with the value mindset uh, of, a, of, a, of a narrow group of, 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 of tech uh, leaders uh, who came out of a world in the 1980s of, of privilege and, and frankly naivete that uh, has to be uh, left behind. Thanks. Uh, Professor Viragun, did you have something to add to that? Uh, well, two components. One is to say that this is uh, extremely uh, nicely put and clearly put by Shannon. 
Um, let me just add a potential way out. Uh, but before that, let me point out the need for speed on that way out. Um, you know, knowledge and power have always gone together in human history. And there was increasingly the potential in the late 20th century that access to knowledge could be democratized. But in the late 20th century, something happened, which is the asymmetry between those who have knowledge and power on one side and those who don't have either on the other actually grew. Uh, and it grew at warp speed because of the use of technology along with knowledge, particularly the tools of artificial intelligence. Now, very soon, everywhere in the world, increasingly, it's possible for knowledge and technology to come together to tell you what is good for you and tell you that reasonably correctly. It basically disempowers you in an extreme manner. Um, you're being advised at every step, rich or poor, on what is good for you and what your next step is. Now, how, what is the way out? Fortunately, uh, you know, I think countries like India here should take the lead, but also other countries of the South. The dominant theme in technology today is becoming more and more um, software and less and less hardware. And therefore, a large scale understanding and learning in your own language, in mathematics, in statistics, and a deep cultural mooring can allow you to develop technological tools very rapidly because they're largely driven by software and young people will do that well in a manner which you can claim back your lives and livelihood. Now this sounds a bit abstract, but this needs to be done so that we decentralize these um, technological uh, you know, demons or giants which we've unleashed and bring them under control. They have extraordinary value uh, the technologies, not the giants, um, in allowing us to reach out and understand our environment in incredible ways. They also linked with the means of production, allow uh, production to take place either through design or actual prototyping in smaller areas, uh, obviating the need of large scale migration to cities as necessary. Um, they allow routes to sustainable development. Uh, and therefore, these all have potential for reclaiming the planet, not only for humans, but remember that now because of what we have done to the planet, humans are the stewards of all the planet. So, but these kinds of things can happen at speed and they need to happen at speed only if large uh, groups of young people in India take to both technology and a deep cultural mooring. That combination is what is necessary. Uh uh, thanks, Dr. Vijayar. Uh, Professor Bala, I want to come back to you at a later stage on this uh, because I think it's worth uh, digging in detail into this issue about, you know, what, as the PSA said, what are some of the, you know, what, what is the cultural mooring in which technology is incubated and deployed. But uh, Dr. Vijayar, I wanted to speak to you about something that's, uh, you know, sort of uh, digressing a little bit. And this is also a topic that I talk about uh, in my book, which was uh, uh, what was called the Colombo Plan, something that you are uh, aware of and you know you've tweeted about it in the past um the the uh, the plan that was created by a group of commonwealth countries that included india in 1950 uh, crafted in colombo and which proved to be enormously helpful uh, not just to india but for other developing countries which was able to access expertise and resources uh, not just from uh, developed countries of the Commonwealth, but also countries like India, which had by then made over the course of two decades and more, uh, made significant progress in some indigenous technologies and technical capacities. Um, and I'm reminded of it uh, and the successes of the Colombo plan uh, while reading about and listening to all the news that's coming in about India's vaccine diplomacy, about the number of countries that have been aided by India uh, with shipments of vaccines. Um, now, of course, you know, there are political overtones to such vaccine diplomacy, which is natural. There are, um, there are economic overtones uh, as well. But uh, if you were to sort of place this in context in terms of India's outreach, in terms of providing access to and exporting its own technical capacities and resources to other developing countries, 
how have we fared in recent years before the pandemic hit and now that the vaccine diplomacy has really pushed open those doors again uh, can we really think about a new colombo plan or something that similarly uh, mirrors what happened in the 50s and the 60s with regards to our exporting of technical capacities um you know uh, first of all the colombo plan and those approaches um valuable as they may have been at that time need a dramatic change in today's context because of the urgency of the situation we are facing as a planet um so we need to see how we can scale these things both by actual interactions as well as uh, export and import of uh, collaborations of various kinds sure so that's something which we need to imagine the second component is that if you look at uh many areas vaccines and generic drugs are example india has done extraordinarily well even before the pandemic um we have you know for example saved about 250 million lives in africa in the uh, you know men- uh, meningococcal vaccines and pneumococcal vaccines and other kinds of vaccines it's been absolutely extraordinary uh and this has been done uh by uh a small set of companies uh who have taken vaccines which no other companies will manufacture because they don't make profits on that made it at high quality and at low cost now this has been true for hiv anti hiv drugs too uh you know cipla it can be argued has saved you know millions of lives in africa uh so now in the pandemic we also saw in addition two different things happening in addition to making vaccines which have been developed elsewhere indian companies also develop vaccines here that's quite extraordinary they are also now getting into developing drugs here and similarly in other kinds of technologies as deregulation takes place you're going to see technologies develop the principal problem in independently developing technology in india has been that indian companies have capital but they don't have risk capital um you know for example a company like Google will spend more in its annual R&D budget than all of the National Science Foundation of the US combined. Um so that's just one company. So Indian companies need to partner with Indian academia and research institutes to mitigate risk to develop products for India and for the world. And I think that is more and more likely to happen. Right. Um you know I sort of want to since we have I think around 10 minutes left let me just uh sort of shuffle back to professor vala and sort of pick to what uh, professor vijay ragon said about risk capital now um there's distinctly the, the in silicon valley especially the idea that the entrepreneur is taking on the world and whatever he or she creates um is a technological advancement that has been built against all odds now the advancement may be a socially useful technology in silicon valley's case many of the technologies that have been built for the last 5 10 years can't really be pegged to any any kind of positive social uh, social economic advancement but that that pers- that that culture persists and it is deeply rooted i would say and you know folks may disagree that it is deeply rooted in an individualistic approach to solving problems um which allows you to take risks which um perhaps allows failure to be an option which which may not be a viable option in communal societies in other parts of the world and, and india is definitely um, a, a society that thinks communally with regards to solving problems um you know but on the other hand all the problems that you spoke about to in response to a previous question of mine which is uh, the roots of our problem in thinking about 21st century technologies is that they're still rooted in a 1980s or a 70s approach where the individualistic you know materialistic attitude towards technology and economic advancement really held its own during these uh, decades uh, so any kind of paradigm shift uh in ways of thinking about technology really is seen especially in the united states i cannot speak to other uh, jurisdictions the, as as a byproduct of this materialistic uh culture uh, you saw this with the counterculture movement in the united states and even today politicians who are trying to reframe the discourse and trying to say you know bring in things like the green new deal as part of mainstream political discourse are being you know painted in very demonistic terms 
uh, which makes this you know something that always happens at the margins maybe that will change uh, but uh, you know these kind of paradigm shifts whether they're cultural economic in the united states because it is deeply rooted in this individualistic industrial oriented society always seems to be happening at the margins will the pandemic really change that i don't know um but i do know that uh whatever happens in the united states um doesn't need to be the pattern that is repeated elsewhere and um i i think one thing that we uh, need to think about is um when we conceive this as a problem of incentives okay. and that's just one way to look at this but it's a very powerful way to look at it um what we have to understand is that it's not enough to provide people with resources if the incentives in the system that they are responding to are misaligned with what you want them to use those resources to do and when you talk about for example uh less individualistic more communitarian models of technology development what you have to understand then is what are the incentives in that environment that people are responding re responding to and how can you align those incentives with the um with the results that you want uh this process to bring about um i know that sounds very abstract but you know what you have for example in the united states context is a lot of people who really want um uh, perhaps to create technologies that benefit humanity over the long term but the incentive structures that they're operating under uh require short term uh gains to be rapidly consolidated at the expense of long term uh right. uh, uh uh strategies and the fact that it uh cont continues to happen is because no one has changed the broader system incentives um right. but then the the thing that is the opportunity in places like india is that the incentives can be different right um and one of the things that uh, i i think we we need to look to in terms of uh policy for example at government levels is thinking about okay how do we provide people with the kinds of um incentives um that uh ensure them uh against uh a uh, risk in in the proper sorts of ways so um if it's you know bill gates um or um steve jobs you know their insurance is the fact that their parents aren't going to let them starve on the street right and that they have a uh, a safety net uh that is provided uh, by their individual circumstances um and in the united states frankly if you don't have that individual safety net increasingly you have no safety net at all but other countries uh have uh the freedom to separate themselves from this kind of uh, uh sort of self-destructive um uh, avoidance of social security for example um right. and understand that actually giving people uh, even a relatively minimal kind of a floor of social security will allow them to take creative risks uh that uh will really surprise uh uh people and and i think people don't especially young people many of them don't want to get or don't need to get incredibly wealthy right away they just don't want to fall behind they just don't want to do something that's going to damage their long term prospects of having a home and a family and sort of the basic things that we all want uh for ourselves and so you just need to to give them enough that if they fail they're not further behind um and that's actually pretty easy for a lot of governments to start doing right and i mean time does not permit us to go further into this but some of the innovations that are happening in india on what we call our digital public goods would certainly be of interest to you if you haven't already been you know following on some of the platforms that are being built by the indian government with the help of the private sector uh, which allows for a certain uh, common digital platform through which services are you know tapped into by the citizen but i fully agree with you i think the tsa sort of uh, aspired for risk capital to be present in india to which i say you should be careful what you wish for because the incentives of risk capital in silicon valley have been thoroughly misaligned with the social goals that they um, uh, you know sought to create at least in the so you know mark anderson says it's time to build and then the thing that uh, his partnership firm invests in is clubhouse so, you know the, the idea of uh, what uh, silicon valley wants to build 
then finally what comes out is very different. But uh, to the PSA, maybe we can sort of conclude this session with a provocative question to him, which is, you know, we were speaking and you sort of eloquently defended the idea of uh, free of flow and exchange of ideas and capital to and from uh, countries. But I wanted to ask the, uh, the uh, Professor Vijay Raghavan uh, about this uh, this unicorn of self-reliance that we chase. And this is you know, not something that is unique to this government. Uh, any uh, government in India that is politically elected always aspires to self-reliance. Uh, this government has sort of coined the slogan, uh, Atman Nirbhar Bharat, which means self-reliant India. But, uh, you know, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, uh, you know, about as, as somebody who has, uh, you know, as a professional also, I'm sure benefited from the free flow of ideas and resources, uh, both as a, you know, whether as a doctoral student, as, or as a scientist in training and now uh, in government. How compatible is this idea of self-reliance with uh, our goal of fostering a greater flow of ideas and capital to and from India? You know, the mistake would be to transliterate this into uh, something which is not meaningful in any world, let alone today's world. What the pandemic um, taught us is if you have global supply chains, which are dependent on a one or a few strong nodes, then in a crisis and the crisis will happen, you will end up in a disaster. And in a large country, the disaster will be very strong. Uh, and therefore, it is important to have global supply chains with many nodes of moderate strengths rather than few nodes of high strength. It's just that. Once that is there, then you're home. Uh, I mean, there's nothing more to be said. Uh, you will export, you will import, but you will not be dependent uh, and at the mercy of nature or other, you know, events. That's a, so that's a that? key defense of self-reliance. Uh, I, I think that message should also, I, you know, sometimes the signal can get lost in the noise, as you know. And I think that message should also go out to India's entrepreneurs who are not only based in the country, but also uh, abroad. Uh, and you've Phrase it very well, and it's very difficult to disagree with the way that you phrase it. But on that note, uh, given that we are out of time, and I've received many messages from the JLF organizers reminding me of the time, I wanted to thank you both, and I'm sure the organizers will as well. Uh, thank you both for spending your time uh, on a weekend to talk about these issues. Uh, I'm sure Zoom fatigue has uh, <laughs> has set in already for both of you, given the many panels and sessions that you're part of. But uh, Thanks to both of you for being part of this uh, conversation and over to you, Sanjay. Thank you, Shannon Valor. Thank you, K. Vijay Raghavan and Arun Mohan Sukumar for this incredible session on the future and what we hold in store for us. We thank our celebration partners, Diageo. Thank you all for watching and being such a great audience. Please do stay locked on and watch all our episodes across the festival over the next few days. Please do help by donating if you can and contributing to teamwork cards as the cultural sector has been critically impacted by the pandemic. Do also remember to tweet using the hashtag Jaipur Literature Festival 2021 and use our Twitter handle at Jaipur Lit Fest. Remember the festival is protected by Dettol. Stay safe, stay masked. For me, travel is the best teacher, sometimes even more than books. You sense a place with all your senses, you know, from taste to sight to sound. So I think it's so important to be able to travel. The more you travel, the more uh, landscapes that you come across, those are the landscapes which become uh, the defining factor of what you work. To learn in a week it, by traveling is more than what you learn in an entire semester of an MBA program. Physical traveling from one place or through the pages, or through planes and plane windows matters.